CBC News. Hello. Yes. Good morning. This is John Franken in Montreal. Yes. Do you have uh, uh, any notion that uh, tomorrow will be the demonstration in front of the Japanese embassy? So tomorrow morning at quarter to seven, I'll be at your house, God willing. I play it. I play it. Sunny? So, 11? Uh, uh, I think we can make it 11. Will be fine. You see, the reason I asked for 11, because otherwise we will be here. It's not uh, summer anymore. Okay. Yeah, 11 o'clock? 11 o'clock. It's okay. I'm a free day for it's okay. Three is fine. Three is fine. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Oh, I said it was a nice young fellow. He is a nice young fellow. I am a very nice young fellow. I won't call him the phone. I'm Barry Van Dyke. Oh, yeah. John! 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 Hi, Mummy. John Franken, a former POW, is taken inside the embassy. He's hoping for an apology, but he'll have to settle for a cup of tea like last year and the year before. John Franken is 80 years old and a full-time activist. He's trying to get the Japanese government to recognize crimes committed during World War II. 58 years after the end of the war, Japan has yet to acknowledge them, let alone apologize. There. Yes, he's a good boy, but he's very messy and every, in every corner and everywhere there is, there is junk. I call it junk. I don't know. I don't know for what he is saving all the stuff. I don't know. Maybe I have it here. For me? I would take the whole thing out with it. <laughs> ah, here I got it. How you like that? This is the paper. It shows where I've been taken in as a Japanese POW. They show you the name, and the nationality, rank, place of capture. Here it is Mark, Japanese Makassar. This is on the island of Sulawesi. My father's name, the place of origin, this is where I was born, Samarang in Indonesia. They asked me for my religion. So I told them I'm Jewish. You know, like, uh, I have to choose religion, Hebrew religion. They never, the guy who interviewed me 
or the meet the nose. He never heard of that. So he said, it's too complicated for me. He put Islam. in 1942, Japan had invaded all of Southeast Asia in just six months. Indonesia was still a Dutch colony then. It was there, on the island of Java, that John was born. When John turned 18, he was drafted at the height of the war. The Japanese invaded Indonesia while he was still in boot camp. In fact, he was being evacuated on a merchant ship headed for Australia when two Japanese warships accosted them and captured all the passengers. John had just become a prisoner of war, along with thousands of other Dutch citizens. Once captured, he was sent to a Japanese prison camp. John's three brothers, who were also detained as POWs, ultimately survived the camps, but not their mother whom John never saw again. Good morning, class. Good morning. There we are, at last. My name is John Franken. I am an ex-prisoner of war. And I'm going to talk about the war you hope never to see. When I was your age, we had an elementary school with wonderful teachers, not thinking about anything what can happen in six or eight months. I mean, same thing here. Who think about this, something what is going to happen eight months from now? So many things can happen overnight. Think about that. Enjoy today, because tomorrow can be all different. Um, how many days were you kept as a slave? Three and a half years and two days. Three and a half years not to know what the following day will bring you. How did you get treated in the prison camps? We were doing what we call slave labor. That means you have to work if you like it or not. We were so badly treated that it's no imagination what people can do to other people. We also went sent out to make bordellos. I don't know, does that explain bordellos? Does anybody know what the word bordello means? No. Uh, bordellos are places where the Japanese put women in there for their own satisfaction. This is forced, this rape. They also picked up girls from the street, 14 years old, 16 years old, and they were just taken up, picked up from the street, put in the truck. The mothers don't know what happened to their kids. And this is the way the Japanese were doing. The Japanese Imperial Army quickly established a sophisticated system of sexual slavery for the benefit of its soldiers. Over 200,000 teenage girls, mostly Korean, were kidnapped and sent to military brothels. They were called comfort women. POWs like John were forced to build the Army's comfort stations, often converting elementary schools. Then, they had to work in the stations. John's task was to bring rags to the women to wipe themselves in between soldiers. The Japanese government denied the existence of these sexual camps until 1993, when it finally acknowledged them. But it has yet to apologize to any of the women who were detained there and raped by 30 to 40 soldiers a day. They yell out, Tulum, Tulum, that means help, help. You know, you want to help, but you cannot. You know, like it's a very 
mixed feeling because you know it's sad, you know, that you could not do anything for them. But the government didn't want to compensate them officially. I myself have been demonstrating every year on the 7th of December in front of the Japanese embassy in Ottawa. Just for the Japanese to say sorry. If they did say sorry, would you keep telling your story to kids? Well, you see, this is my job just to <coughs> let the kids know what has happened or what can happen if you don't prevent it. You see, we want to bring the kids up in such a way that they said, we shall never go through that again. Uh, Sonia, the kitchen. you sit and I will make you something. Okay. You had enough today. Oh, I have to brush my hair. Your hair, you, did, you just did brush your hair. Did I brush my hair? Yes. No. You did like this. Yeah, you did like that. you have to come back? I have to come back to the, the shirt of uh, January. For another one? For another treatment, yeah. Next Monday you have the chemo again? Chemo, yeah. The ninth. He goes everywhere. What have to do with the war? He is busy with, always busy with it. And I never talk about it. And here, look, Auschwitz. I never talk about it. But he is so busy with, with that. Well, it keeps me going. Uh, yeah, yeah. I never talk about the war. I get nervous from it. And I get upset and I get angry. You know, all I have, my cancer, I have to thank Hitler for that, you know? It is from the concentration camp, what I have. From the stress. From the stress. You know, there is a time to forgive, but not to forget. You know, we have two, two different things here. You know, I can forgive them if they make it available. I Say, listen, we ask yeah. forgiveness. What we did to you, we're sorry. This is the whole point. Montreal, 27 February 1960. Lieve Sonja, ik heb net een blok vliegtuig papier, airmail letter papier gekocht. En mekaar beter te leren kennen, zal er een heleboel gepend moeten worden. En misschien is het zo dat er niet met schrijven beter mijn gedachten gewisseld kan worden. Natuurlijk zou verschillende dingen makkelijker en eenvoudiger geweest zijn als je hier om de hoek zou wonen. Maar, kom tijd, kom tijd. Wanneer word je 35 jaar? Ik word volgende maand 38, dus het leeftijdverschil is oké. Okay. Verder begin ik al een beetje te grijzen aan de kanten, maar dat zal wel komen omdat ik het leven mij niet zonder kleerscheuren heeft gedaan. John en Sonja spent the war years thousands of miles apart, unaware of each other's existence. But their fate was already sealed by two autocratic regimes that had joined forces to take over the world. Hitler in Europe and Emperor Hirohito in Asia. While Sonia was in Auschwitz, John was being held in Japanese camps, which were in fact forced labor camps. Prisoners were severely underfed 
and a fourth died before the end of the war. I wonder if the world knows about all these things. What the people are doing to other people. Incredible, incredible. While researching the issue of Japanese POWs, John discovered further evidence of Japanese war crimes and realized that he is a part of a community of victims, including the victims of biological weapons devised by Japan, which contaminated hundreds of Chinese villages with typhoid fever, cholera, and anthrax. To develop and refine its biological weapons, Japan needed guinea pigs. It turned to POWs. Today, Japan denies resorting to such methods, despite survivors' testimony to the contrary. What they did to me, they did to them. Let's get this over with. And if they say sorry, send them my purpose here. I think this is my purpose for the rest of my life to get this straightened out. And I keep on going. Because they are not in a position to judge other people if they have come, come clean with their past. They, you know, you can't judge other people. You have to be clean yourself, pure. Like, uh, you never have apologized. But you think the United States are pure? I don't think so. Protest actions of all kinds have become regulated, and everyone, including John, has to follow the rules to speak out against the world's second economic power. Good morning. Hi. I uh, am an ex -POW. I like to walk in front of the Japanese uh, consulate and the 600 bike was here. Okay. On the sidewalk only. No, we don't uh, go anywhere inside or anything like that. Okay, how many people are going to be there? Just me. Only you? Okay, and uh, around what time? Oh, maybe in about 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Okay, so we're going to make a special attention for that, so uh, we'll uh, inform our police officer about that. Thank you. Okay? Clearly appreciate it. Okay.
Good morning. After so many years, you still have to educate people. It took 2,000 years to bring it to this stage, but we still maybe need another 2,000. Lieve Sonja, als ik 80 ben, ben jij 76. Dat is nog 4, 42 jaar. Kun je je indenken wat er nog allemaal van te maken valt en kun je terugzien op iets vruchtbaars van het leven gemaakt te hebben, dan ben ik best tevreden. En God danken ervoor. When the war ended, my idea was to re-establish myself. I didn't look for help from the government or anybody. We were young still. See, don't forget, most of the soldiers were young. And when the war ended, we were still young. And that was why uh, there was not so much demand for redressing of injustices. The governments didn't have any idea what were the consequences of malnutrition of the magnitude that we have gone through. You are so right. Now, when we started recovering, we put on flesh, we put on body, and everybody said, well, you're all right, you look all right. Is the Canadian Hong Kong Veterans uh, Commemorative Associations, would it be ticking up you know, this uh, redress issue, you know, in future, or, or, you know, is it going to be sort of... Uh... But the question is, who will you take it up with? The Japanese government or the Canadian well, government? You it see, it, it, government. no, it shouldn't be the Canadian government. It should be the Japanese government. But <clears throat> the Japanese government wouldn't listen. They wouldn't listen at all, no. They just say, well, we signed a treaty in 1951, and that's it. That's right. The peace treaty, signed in 1951, was orchestrated by the United States. As the great victors of World War II, the U.S. was entitled to demand compensation from Japan, not just for the forced labor of prisoners, like John, but for all victims. Yet the U.S. chose to relinquish this right because they had another agenda. Five years earlier, at the end of the war, the Tokyo Tribunal had been set up to rule on Japanese war criminals. But the U.S., as sole prosecutor, chose to ignore reports on sexual camps and biological warfare. Why? Because a secret deal had been struck. The U.S. agreed to grant immunity to certain Japanese war criminals in exchange for the results of experiments on biological weapons. John has been asking for an apology for 10 years now. If it takes him another 10 years, he'll be 90 years old. I have a, a picture here, matter of fact, from the people from last year. I got about the same amount of people, I hope. There are several, two who are not there anymore. Mr. Val and his wife, 
passed away. He, she died first, and three months after, he passed away of a heart attack. So that's why they couldn't be here at the meeting. So there are two less this year. So every year, we're getting less and less. All witnesses are gone, they can say whatever they like. If there is no more me who are there, who is going to tell? They're going to deny it. Just keep trying. One day, maybe we will. The war in Europe ended in May 1945. But in the Pacific, fighting continued. Japan actually intensified its war effort. To meet its growing needs for raw materials, POWs were used as miners. John was transferred to a coal mine in Nagasaki. On August 9th, when the atomic bomb was dropped, John was several hundred meters below ground. When he came out of the mine that day, the landscape had vanished. We didn't know anything about the bomb hit Nagasaki at that time. We were underground, and when we came up after the we night shift, I was coming in the morning, and we saw this big plume. We said, oh my gosh, something really big has hit. And we didn't know, because the day after, the commander of the camp came and said, the war is over. Do you think that um, the dropping of the two atomic bombs was necessary to end the war? Was it a good way to end it? Well, you see, what is good and bad, to check it now after, is very hard to say. But when one shot, they caught many people where the Japanese killed also millions of people, and because of the atomic bomb, they could abruptly stop this killing. They had no way out. Around the, the perimeter of the, of the prison camp, there were all soldiers with machine guns standing ready that if the Americans landed, all prisoners of war would have been killed, period. So I could really say my life was safe by the atomic bomb. Do you believe that Japan deserves the apology from the United States for dropping the atomic bombs on Japan? I don't think so. No? no. But the American government did, in dropping the atomic bombs, kill tens of thousands of civilians. And your argument, if I'm right, is that the Japanese government mistreated civilians. Why should the Japanese apologize first? I think it's a, it's a two-way street, I think. Yeah, like if one starts apologizing, the other one should apologize too. And uh, it's a very difficult question here. I, mean. okay. I really, I don't know. You're learning, but I'm learning too. You know, because uh, so some of the questions is that, listen, they give you to think, hey, how come you never thought of that first? You know, like it's, so it is a, a two-way street. And I really appreciate you being here.
Hooray! Happy, Happy birthday to you. you. Happy you birthday to you. And you look like you're in love. Happy birthday to you. Take a wish. Mwah. Happy birthday, Papa. I made my wish. Oh, you made your wish? Oh, yeah, do it. Happy birthday! Woo! Yay! Papa? Yes? You're 81. How does it feel? How does it feel? I can't grasp it yet. I feel like 18. How much of a difference is it going to make in the long run? Are the Japanese really going to give him what he wants in his lifetime, I can only hope. That would be my, my dream for him. That's, that's why he's doing all this, is to get the, those results. And, you know, if every year he's getting a little bit closer and, you know, one year he's standing in the freezing cold and gets, not, you know, no attention, and then a couple of years later they actually, you know, come out of the embassy and he gets to hand them a petition and then the year later, they say, come inside, and then the next year, he's having tea with them. I'm thinking, well, there's progress, <laughs> you know, like, where it's going to lead, uh, you know, only time, only time can tell. In Malayan, we say, pukul terus. What does that mean? That means, never give up. Never give up. Mi da if and she mein kind she oigen, light me auf mein Herz, bis bei mir dort euch von Eppele, auf mir dein Schen Keppele, mein Jingle. Mein Kadischel, oi mir to sein Fadi. Liste. Ik was even bang toen ik in Montreal was dat het niet zou zijn wezen. Maar toen ik je zag en hoorde, was het net of er een grammofoonplaat werd opgezet met mooie muziek. En wist ik dat je samen door het leven zouden gaan. Salmon leaf and lead salmon to dragon. After the war, a mutual friend introduced John and Sonia by correspondence. They began exchanging letters. He survived Nagasaki. She survived the gas chambers three times. Each time, the gas ran out. Two unlikely survivors had found one another. People take too much for granted. Just one crazy guy who have it in his mind to do something and he has some followers, you are at their mercy. Life here, it gets just changed overnight. Hey, oh. <laughs> Ray, let me give you your present. Welcome to British Columbia, okay, and compared to uh, Montreal, compared to Montreal, it's rainy here, so we brought you a nice... No, I'm You gonna sit there? Yeah. Okay. 
That sign last night? No, I, I use it in Montreal all the time. Oh, when okay. I go in, this, in, 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 the, in front of the Japanese embassy in Montreal in Ottawa, oh, yeah. Yeah. that's what I carry. Yeah. Where are you from? Japan. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Grandma Huang Kim Ju, uh, a Korean survivor of Japanese military sexual slavery. Thank you, Grandma. Mr. Xu Jiashe, Chinese survivor of Japanese biological warfare in China. <laughs> Mrs. Kinuko Lasky, survivor of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. Thank you. Yeah. I was there. Mm -hmm in the islands of uh, Indonesia mm -hmm. when the Japanese picked up the girls from the street mm -hmm. and put them in trucks. Dana. We all went through the same thing. 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 이 이름은 내 얼굴이 붉어져지고 마음이 이상하고 막, 막 그래서 그게 실질적 얘기는 헐라고 참 창피스러운 일이 많아. You know, I know what she went through. You know, like it's a, an idea nobody can understand unless you were there. 생각하면 가슴이 탁 터져 나가. 그런 거 생각. Breaks her heart. 탁 터져 나가고 밥도 먹고 싶지도 않고 어떻게 해야. 저 일본 사람들을 불러서 막 이렇게 쥐어 뜯어서 그냥 속이 시원하게 만들까 그런 생각 보냐? I hope she will see in her lifetime what is left that one day the Japanese will really apologize, you know, like to give her peace of mind. Mr. Shu witnessed many atrocities committed by the Japanese military and has endured for 61 years the physical and psychological trauma of his rotten legs, the aftermath of his anthrax infection. I'm very glad to meet you. You too. So that's a picture of protesting. This is me. So you keep hitting the stone on the same spot. And one day it will break. We Chinese are also very tolerant. Ah, we need to
Your Excellency, here I am again, as in previous years on the 7th of December. Now it is coming. <coughs> it may be disappointing that we are still strong and alive, so that we can tell the world that we are still waiting for an official apology. John, the tea is ready. I am coming. John has thought of everything for this year's demonstration. Except for one small detail. He has a new car. Nine five eight. Nine five eight oh five five eight. That's for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Hello. Good morning. This is John Franklin in Montreal. Yes. I come to have a demonstration tomorrow in front of the Japanese embassy. Well, we can't. You know, we only have so many cameras. Hello. Hello. Is this the Ottawa citizen? Yes, it is. This is John Franken speaking in Montreal. Okay, you're looking for... I'm looking for uh, to bring you a news item. One moment, please. This is Dave Brown. I can't take your call right now. I sent you a fax about my uh, demonstration tomorrow in front of the Japanese embassy. I'll send you to one of our assignment people. They look at all the possible strategies. News, may I help you? This is John Franken in Montreal. Yes. Yeah. I will uh, demonstrate in front of the Japanese embassy tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. In Ottawa? In Ottawa. It's coming. Yeah. We we'll have to. I think the station is the last one. The last one. Yeah, it's coming. You can't ignore the last one. I need my hand. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. You kind of know your last time as well. How's that? Oh. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> unbelievable. You're unbelievable. All right, is Mr. Van Dijk not here? It's a beautiful thing. See, uh, pleased to see you again. Yes, sir. Nobody of the, the media came in. Eh? Nobody of the media. No, no, I phoned everyone. Everyone. Once again, John is invited into the embassy. Like last year, he will ask for an apology. Like last year, he will only receive a cup of tea. If you keep being persistent, you know, with this one goal in your mind to achieve, I think that would be, for me, a satisfaction. I have a goal, this is what I like to do. And uh, people don't see it that way. Some people said, well, why, you could, why bother? You can't change the world. But I can keep trying.
Every year at this time, we pause to remember those who fought in the great wars. But for those under 50, it's not always easy to relate. James Ling High School is trying to change all that. It's connecting students with war veterans. Bob Benedetti has the story. Here's Japan, Australia, and right in between here is, is what they call today Indonesia. That's where I was born. John Franken was just a teenager when he was drafted into the Dutch Army just in time for the fall of Java. And then we Japanese came in full force and overtake, overtook the Dutch Far East government. He remembered boarding a ship to Australia, only to be intercepted by the Japanese. The Japanese captain came aboard and he said, your guys are now prisoners of war. He said, everybody is under my command. Anybody will not obey, will be shot. The students were horrified to hear of life in the POW camp at Nagasaki. It was just hard labor. We had no winter clothes. The first week we arrived, I was standing there and we took cement bags, we cut holes in it, and we put it on so that the wind doesn't get to you. When he finished, the students surrounded him. How did he survive, they wanted to know. So he just live on hope. So like, uh, tomorrow we will see what happens, and it's just keep on going. And we, the morale was, to the end, in the group where we were, was uh, very high. You know, this is what I'm about. you supporting each other in, through the ordeals. And, you know, you'd be surprised how much you have to, sh to share with other people. Much of his story was new to these teens because they don't learn much about Canada's war history in school. Uh, definitely not. Uh, in fact, I think we underplay it a lot. That appalls history teacher Mark Anthony Meyer. And unfortunately, a lot of these veterans are dying off, so they're not going to be here much longer to tell us in person about this. So we better give ourselves a collective boot in the butt and, uh, and, and learn about our own history. And that's the objective of the Memory Project Digital Archive. It's an effort to enable veterans to put their memories online for future generations before it's too late. John Franken is part of the project, and that's why he's here. It gives me a very good feeling. I really, should, I did my, my part. You know, that little bit of time that I have left make it really fruitful for, to pass on something if he encourages only one or two students to look deeper he says he has done his job if i learn about his experience you know then we can you know prevent this from ever happening again bob benedetti tfcf news <laughs> members statement Stop. once wrote that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Speaker, it is my privilege to introduce to this assembly a truly good man who has attempted almost single-handedly for the past 50 years to do what is right. John Franken is an 81-year-old proud Canadian citizen who, while serving in the Dutch Navy in World War II, was captured by the Japanese and held as a prisoner of war for almost four years. Personally tortured and subjected to years of inhumane treatment, Mr. Franken was an eyewitness to a litany of war crimes committed by Japanese military and occupying forces. Mr. Franken is in the visitor's gallery and would he please rise. Mr. Franken was a slave laborer in Nagasaki when the atomic bomb fell on that city. He survived this explosion because he was working deep in a mine under the city. Freed by the sudden capitulation of the Japanese regime, Mr. Franken has for the past 50 years attempted to obtain a formal apology from the Japanese government on behalf of himself and the known and nameless victims of Japanese war crimes. Let us hope that through Mr. Franken's tireless efforts, the Japanese government will at long last adopt the honorable course and issue a formal apology to the dwindling number of the surviving victims of Japan's aggression and war crimes in World War II. Thank you. Thank you.
Welcome back to Daytime Ottawa, back to share an incredible story of survival mm -hmm. and of positive attitude. It's, it just amazes me. We're joined by an XPOW and atomic bomb survivor, John Franken, and his beautiful daughter, Rosalind. Welcome to the show to Thank both of you. you. Thanks so much for being here. John, uh, of course, uh, it's an amazing story. Let's first of all go back to you um, getting involved in, in, the, in the war itself. How did that all come to be? Well, I was conscripted in July 41, and I got a course for, for aircraft mechanic, which signed for 10 years, and then December came, and then the war broke out in Pearl Harbor, right. mm -hmm. thanks to Japan. Mm -hmm. They still haven't apologized yet. Yes, and you've, you've actually visited the Japanese embassy for many, many years, asking for years. an apology for the last wow. 20 years. And why do you think they, they refuse to apologize? They will never admit it. They said, we, we you know, like uh, Iran said, the Holocaust never happened. Right. You know, like they're living in a, in a dream world. And if the atomic bomb hasn't been dropped, the American has lost many, 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 many more people. And I was saved by the atomic bomb. Well, can you tell us a bit about how that happened to be? Well, I was working in the shipyard cleaning all this, sorry, dirt. Right. And uh, they asked, so I got the bath every seven weeks. So then they came along and said, any volunteers for the coal mines? And already have a bath every day because you get black from the coal. So I was down below 2,000 feet when the, they dropped the bomb and saved my life. That's and then, John, then you came up, and what did you think had happened? Did you have any idea what had no, happened? No, we didn't know. We thought they hit an ammunition dump, but it was too far away. It's like in Montreal, the mountain was, it was behind the mountain, so we didn't know anything until three weeks after. Wow. When we went through it to be the transport. And you were obviously a POW at the time. What did you go through during that period of time? Well, we worked in the shipyard, slave labor, and I'm here to talk about it. I'm just lucky. Right. It's such a positive message that you bring. It's such a tragedy what you experience, but you're bringing it forward for us to learn and share with you. But you're seeing it as a positive experience, which is so never give up. Yeah. 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 Well, Rosalyn, what about yourself? I mean, this is your dad's story. Your mom had her own story. Tell us about your mom's story. Well, I think uh, it's a very unique story that I have because my dad survived the atomic bomb being saved by, uh, you know, being in the coal mines while my mother was fighting for her life in Nazi Germany. She was in 13 different concentration camps and she was between about the ages of 14 to 16, like as a mm -hmm. teenager, her childhood years, right? And right. Mm -hmm. She was actually taken to the gas chamber three times and each time they had just run out of gas. Yeah. And before they could fill up with gas again, she was being transferred to another camp. So to me, it's a miracle that she survived. It's a miracle that my dad survived. So I believe in miracles. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, you do. And um, as a motivational speaker, I mean, what I do for a living mm -hmm. is to inspire people and uplift people and give them understand the meaning of hope. Mm -hmm. I mean, here, the, I had incredible role models, right? Mm -hmm. And um, being a cancer survivor, how, you know, in fighting that, again, using their inspiration, what you can go through in life. Like, people go through hardships, but we don't realize how lucky we are to yeah. be living in this country, the freedom that we have, and the, the problems that we think we have. Sometimes we need to hear the stories of other mm -hmm. people, what they have suffered, and realize, you know what? I can get through my situation. Well, they suddenly seem so trivial. Well, uh, right? yes. The things that we complain yes. about on a daily basis. Right? It's beautiful what you've done with it. Some people would become angry or bitter or, you know, closed in and not share your experiences, but you've turned everything around from your parents being so inspirational to your own stories and Absolutely. motivating others. And I think it's such a tribute. The, such a tribute. Thank you. the denial of Japan with the sex slaves took the one woman. 50 years to go through the course to Japan to prove that, that they really, up till today, they said it never happened. Yeah. yeah, because you, as I understand it, you were also helping build brothels in Japan brothels, as yes. part of the slave labor that you went through. Sex slaves, they were picked up on the way to school, put up for, 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 for diseases, 
and then rape. 40 women a day. 40 men. John, how do you keep a positive attitude after all of these years having seen what you've seen and, and gone through what you've gone through? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because you have a wonderful sense of humor, you know, you're talking to you in the green room and you're, you're laid back and you, you love life. I had three, four brothers. Mm -hmm. Three brothers were on the bridge in the river Kauai. One brother was dying and the Japanese threw them in the swamps to die. One native girl found them, brought them back to life and they married the girl after the war. Mm -hmm. The stories are incredible. Yeah. And I hope you're sharing, well, I mean, you're sharing them with us now, but I, I would hope to you have, you've been writing for your whole life and just you documenting. You can Google me. I, oh, yeah, I know. You yeah, offered that you earlier. You visit schools every single November. I know that you recently visited the I school. I got decorated by the Queen from Holland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because of my speaking in schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've done and a wonderful job educating young people. And if you ask people, you stop them on the street, have you heard of an atomic bomb? What are you talking about? Mm. A lot yeah. of people, younger people. But I, I just want to say in terms of, of your positive attitude and, and my mother's positive attitude is you're, in Indonesian they have a saying that says pukul turus, which means never give up. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah. that's what keeps you, that's what keeps them going. Like if you ask my dad how old he is, he'll tell you I'm 90 and a half. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 90, 90 and a half, because every minute counts. Like, Absolutely. You know, Never give up. That's a great beautiful. message to end, end the segment with. John, Rosalind, thanks so much for joining Thank us. You. Really appreciate Thank you for having us. Since Google him. He's right. He's John Franklin, you will YouTube. find tons of information. He's on the YouTube as well. <laughs> That's what we call it around here. Listen, don't go away. We'll be right back with more daytime after this. <laughs> Diffusé ce soir sur le réseau de l'information, nous présente un personnage hors du commun. Il s'appelle John Franken. C'est un Canadien, prisonnier des Japonais pendant la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, qui refuse d'oublier les sévices qu'il a subis pendant ses années d'incarcération. À 80 ans, il poursuit son combat pour obtenir des excuses du Japon. Tout ce qu'il a obtenu pour le moment, c'est un thé à l'ambassade du Japon. La réalisatrice du documentaire est avec nous ce matin. Il s'agit de Catherine Hébert. Madame Hébert, bonjour. Bonjour. Qui est ce personnage, John Franken? Qu'est-ce qui vous a attiré chez lui dans un premier temps? Comment l'avez-vous découvert? Je l'ai découvert, en fait, parce que je faisais la recherche sur le film Why Babies Need Line, dont vous avez sûrement entendu parler. Ben et oui. je me suis retrouvée dans une conférence au Centre droit et démocratie euh, qui parlait des Comfort Women, donc ces jeunes femmes coréennes, pour la plupart, qui avaient été euh, faites prisonnières par les Japonais et mises dans des bordels pour les bons plaisirs des soldats. Et il y avait donc ce vieil homme, John Franken, euh, qui était là, lui, pour témoigner de son expérience dans les bordels. Et il m'avait fascinée parce que je m'étais demandé que fait ce vieil homme dans une cause toute féminine et toute orientale. Ouais. Et donc, c'est comme ça que j'ai découvert son histoire. Alors, la question était intéressante. Qu'est-ce que vous avez appris du personnage, effectivement? Ben, D'abord, il faut savoir que John, il est né en Indonésie, parce que les gens se demandent pourquoi il a été fait prisonnier par les Japonais, parce qu'à l'époque, l'Indonésie était une colonie hollandaise. Et John, ses parents étaient hollandais, ça, je devrais dire néerlandais. Et, euh, et c'est donc quand il faisait son... Il était en entraînement, c'était la conscription, il n'avait pas le choix. Et pendant qu'il était en entraînement, euh, on a dû les évacuer vers l'Australie, tous les, les jeunes soldats en entraînement. Et c'est pendant qu'il qu était évacué qu'il a été fait prisonnier par les Japonais, comme des milliers d'autres citoyens néerlandais. Et d'ailleurs, la mère de John a été faite prisonnière, euh, ses trois frères également, et sa mère est morte dans les camps japonais. Et là, on l'a envoyé aux mines, et c'est probablement ça qui lui a sauvé les pieds, d'ailleurs. On l'a envoyé, il a d'abord travaillé dans les bords. Il a aussi travaillé aux mines à la toute fin de la guerre. Alors que la guerre était terminée en Europe, elle se poursuivait dans le Pacifique. Les Japonais avaient besoin de matières premières. Il est envoyé dans une mine de charbon à Nagasaki. Et il était donc au fond de la mine le jour où on a largué la bombe atomique. Et quand il est remonté à la surface ce jour-là, il n'y avait plus de Nagasaki, il n'y avait plus rien. Quand est-ce qu'il a été libéré? Il a été libéré ben, tout de suite après la bombe atomique à Nagasaki. Euh, un jour plus tard, les Japonais lui ont dit euh, « Vous êtes libre, vous pouvez... Euh... » Et à partir de quand est-ce qu'il a euh, décidé de, de poursuivre des démarches comme celle-là pour obtenir justice, pour obtenir réparation? C'est ça qui est intéressant aussi avec John. Il n'a pas commencé tout de suite après la guerre, parce que comme il explique, après la guerre, nous étions de jeunes hommes, on avait envie de se marier, on avait envie d'avoir des enfants, on avait envie d'avoir une vie normale, et c'est simplement avec le temps que son histoire l'a rattrapé et qu'il a vu que l'injustice allait se poursuivre, alors que les premières années, il espérait peut-être que le Japon allait s'excuser naturellement, des pressions politiques allaient être faites, ça n'a pas été le cas. Et donc, c'est quand lui a pris sa retraite qu'il a décidé de, de, de vraiment vouer sa vie à cette cause-là. Mm -hmm. Et pour l'instant, tout ce qu'il a obtenu, comme je le disais tantôt, c'est un thé à l'ambassade, le oui. titre de votre documentaire, d'ailleurs. Exactement. Et c'est un peu...